So my plan, my plan was that this morning I would get to set this lesson up. Uh, that didn't happen, so I'm just going to give you a synopsis of this morning's sermon. It was a word study on the word church, and uh, the word church is not a building, and it's not something that you do. The word church in the Bible is an assembly of people. Specifically, when we're talking about the Lord's church, or God's church, or the church of Christ, the church of the living God, we're talking about an assembly of people that God has summoned with His own voice. That's the lesson. I know what you're thinking. If you can do that in 27 seconds, you know, why do you have a whole... There's more to it than that, but maybe in the future we'll, we'll explore that one together. But that is uh, especially helpful as we come into this study on the church that Jesus built. Our text is going to be a very familiar text to some of you in Matthew chapter 16. So you can go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew 16. And I'd like to begin reading in verses 13 and 14 together. Matthew 16, verses 13 and 14. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I've missed you this morning, and as has been said a number of times already, it's just not the same to wake up and worship God together with God's people. So I'm happy to do that now with you. Matthew writes in verse 13, Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So it's a lot like today, where Jesus represents different things to different people, depending on you know, your interaction with him and your exposure to him and your background and all of that. Now, the popular opinion back here in, in Jesus' time was fairly positive. These were all, all you know, positive uh, designations, but they all missed the mark. They, they, weren't, they weren't right. And so he turns to his disciples. He turns to the people who were closest with him, who knew him best. They had heard more sermons. They had seen more miracles. They had spent more time with Jesus than anyone else. And so he, he said to them in verse 15, but who do you say that I am. Now, I think Jesus wasn't asking the original question, who do people say that I am, because he didn't know and because he wanted information. I think he was just planting that seed in his disciples' mind to get them thinking what people thought about him so that they would prepare to answer it for themselves, hoping that for, for a better answer. And he gets one. And who is it that speaks up? But Peter. Peter. Simon Peter, verse 16, answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's begin right there. Point number one, Peter's confession. And this is an identity, the identity of Jesus that is divinely revealed. Jesus said to him in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father, who is in heaven. Peter begins by saying, you, you are. Now, I know what other people are saying about you, Jesus, but you, what's going to set you apart is my experience with you, and here's what I think of you. You, unlike these servants of God, you have a special relationship with God. You are the Son of God, and not the dead gods of the Gentiles. You are the Son of the living God. Now, his answer if you uh, read people who understand the Greek language, you could not be more emphatic than Peter is right here. There's ten words in his answer, and four of them are the definite article. He uses the, word, the Greek word the four different times. You are the Christ, the Son, the living, the God. There's no more bold confident, assured way to declare who Jesus is other than what Peter has done right here. Just look at the boldness of his confession. My point is this. Simply, he answers without hesitation. He is confident. He truly believed that this is who Jesus is. He is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And how could Peter be so confident in Jesus' identity? Well, in verse 17... 
Jesus tells us why. Peter didn't come to this conclusion by flesh and blood, an, an idiom for, for human insight, human cleverness. He didn't come to it on, on human terms. Rather, he came to this conclusion by means of a divine revelation, and you can only come to this conclusion by means of a divine revelation. Now, sometimes we say divine revelation, automatically we think God has sort of opened the heavens and he sends his Holy Spirit to you and he's whispering in your ear or something, like he's inspiring one of the apostles maybe to write one of these books or something. Doesn't necessarily mean that. I don't think Jesus means that God miraculously opened up Peter's mind and whispered in his ear and told him who Jesus was. I think Peter had information that was available to everybody. I think Peter drew the right conclusion from the evidence that everybody could see. All of these Galilean towns that Jesus was going to, they were seeing the same thing that Peter was seeing. Go, keep your finger there and go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. John chapter 5, where Jesus talks about the many witnesses to his identity. He's not just coming on the scene, testifying about himself with his own voice. He doesn't expect people to believe who he is and to follow him just because he says so. John chapter 5 and verse 31, If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. Verses 33 through 35, you've got the testimony of John the Baptist. Verse 36, you've got the testimony of my miracles that I do by the power of God. Verses 37 and 38, you've got the testimony of my Father. And verses 39 to the end of the chapter, you've got the testimony of Scripture, all saying what Peter has just confessed right here, that he is the Christ, he is the Son of the living God. Peter just brings all of these witnesses together, all of this evidence together, and he draws the correct conclusion. He understood who Jesus is, and we can too. We can too when we simply read the Gospel with an open heart. Jesus had done enough signs. He had spoken enough sermons. He had shown who He is in accordance with Scripture. In fact, He had he given so many signs, He refused to give more signs. If you look at the beginning of Matthew chapter 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up testing Jesus, asking Him to show them a, a sign from heaven. And Jesus says, enough with these signs. I've given you enough signs. In fact, you're only going to get one more sign. That's the sign of Jonah. And so he refuses to give more signs because the evidence that he has already given is sufficient to draw the conclusion that Peter did, who Jesus is. He's not just a good man. He's not just a prophet. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. And Peter's heart was open enough to collect the evidence, to draw the right conclusion, and he has enough faith to say it with boldness. And Jesus calls him blessed. Blessed are you, for seeing this. Chapter 13 and verse 16. Chapter 13 and verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, he says to his disciples, because they see your ears, because they hear. This is why I'm speaking in parables. So that the people who I make feel uncomfortable, the people that I'm shaking up the status quo and they don't like it, they're blind to me. They're deaf to me. They're dumb to me. But your eyes are open. And blessed are your eyes who see. Blessed are you, Peter. So finally, someone gets it in Matthew's Gospel. And right here, starting in verse 18, the Gospel takes a huge leap forward. Based upon his identity, he launches into an explanation of his mission. Look at verse 18. 18, we move from Peter's confession to Jesus' construction. I also say to you that you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church, my assembly, not my church building, my church. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Keep your finger there and go back to John chapter 1 this time. John chapter 1. The first time Jesus met Peter, something rather extraordinary happened. Andrew comes and finds his brother, Simon, Peter. And in verse 41, he said to him, We found the Messiah, 
which is translated uh, Christ. And so Andrew brings Simon to Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and said, You're Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, Aramaic Kephas, which means rock. Translated means Peter. You are Cephas. You are Peter. He changed his name right there on the spot. Now, if you were Peter, how would that make you feel? Ex excuse me? You know, I can't take that up with my, my mom. She, she, she's the one who named me. But those of you who study the Bible, your ears perked up when Jesus changed Peter's name, didn't it? Because you know when God changes a person's name in the Bible, that is significant. For instance, Abram, Abram, back in the Old Testament, his name meant exalted father. And that was a name that looked to his father, Terah. It was a name that was looking to the past. And God, at some point in the story, changes Abram's name to Abraham, an exalted father, a name that looked to the past. He all suddenly became the father of a multitude, a name looking towards his future, a father of a great nation, the father of Israel. Jacob, Jacob, who came out clutching the heel of his brother, a born deceiver, a supplanter, a deceiver. Later on in his life when he's humbled and he wrestles with the angel of God, God names him Israel. You've striven with me. you fought with me. Now I will fight for you in the future. He goes from the past being a cheater to, to being this great patriarch. When God, My point is simply this, brethren. When God changes a person's name, He is not merely making some cold prediction of the person's future. When God comes on the scene and changes a person's name, He is declaring what He can make out of such a person. He is declaring the, the effect of transformation that He can have in our lives. Saul became Paul. The great Saul of Tarsus had to become Paul, this small, humble man who would go around in the first century planting so many churches, changing so many lives by bringing the gospel to sinners. Peter was a prime example of Jesus' power to transform. Just take a look at Peter's life from the gospels into the book of Acts and you can see the remarkable change and his name, Peter, in Greek means rock. What Jesus was doing in John chapter 1 when he looked into his eyes and he changed his name to Petros. You are a rock, Peter. I anticipate a time when you would become a man of strength, a man of stability, a man who is rock-like in character. And you read the book of Acts after the resurrection of Jesus and we see this boldness. We see this steadfastness under persecution, unwilling to bend, standing up in front of the, 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 the council and the chief priests and the scribes and saying, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to follow my Lord. That's the kind of change that Jesus can have in our lives. Now, Peter's got a long way to go to fulfill his namesake. But right here in John chapter 1, the process was already underway. And right here in Matthew chapter 16, we see an example of Peter becoming what he was always meant to be. He displays that rock-like faith with this bold confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, which prompts Jesus to make a declaration based upon that confession. I will build my church upon a rock. The foundation the foundation of Jesus' ecclesia, His church, is rock. Now again, that word church would be better translated as assembly. The word ecclesia is a compound word in the Greek. Ek means out. Kaline means to call. God is summoning. He is calling out from the world a group of people to convene at the foot of the mountain to be His assembly, to be His special people, to be in a relationship with Him. To be this special convocation of transformed new creations. And he calls us, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, by the word of the gospel of his grace. You've got that gospel. It's in your lap right now. 
And you can read it whenever you want. And every time you read the gospel, God is calling you. And He's summoning you to the foot of the mountain, so to speak. And Jesus says, I'm going to build it. I will build it. Future tense. It's coming. I will build this church. And this church is not going to be a brick and mortar building. It's a living, breathing organism. It's an organic building. An assembly of people belonging to Him. He calls it my church. There were churches. There were assemblies in the first century. There would be, there would be meetings in, in towns. There was one that happened in Ephesus. If you read about it in Acts chapter 17, that was an ecclesia, an assembly of people. But Jesus says, this one's special. It's mine. It belongs to me. And He could say so because He bought it. He paid for it. He ransomed it. Not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of a lamb unblemished. Jesus is going to head up the construction project. He's the designer. He's the builder. He's the owner, not of a physical building, but rather of a living people. And if this building is to stand the, the stress and the pressures of an environment, it's got to be constructed on sure footing so that what goes up doesn't come down. And the best foundation, believe it or not, in 2,000 years it hasn't changed and it never will. The best foundation is rock. If you want a sure foundation, you need to find a place that's sturdy, a place of flat, level stone. And so following this metaphor then of a building, people, human beings who have jobs and families and hobbies, people, just like buildings, are the same way. We need a sure foundation to construct our lives upon. Jesus is giving that to us. So he moves from his confession that he's the Christ divinely revealed to the construction of his church, which leads, unfortunately, to some great confusion about what exactly this rock is that Jesus is founding his church upon. This has caused a great amount of debate and a great amount of false doctrine to be taught, uh, not just today, but throughout the years. And some people believe that Peter himself is the foundation of Jesus' church. And they extrapolate this, this, this line of, of ecclesiology where Peter is the first of many, many popes. This, this long succession of, of potentates. But I think there are some problems with that view. And I want to give you a couple of, of examples to clarify what I believe Jesus is teaching here in Matthew chapter 16. I don't want to tell you what Jesus isn't teaching. I want to teach to you what Jesus is teaching here, hopefully. Uh, first of all, just the way that it's written, just the way that it's semantically, Jesus is making a kind of pun. He's making a kind of wordplay on the, the word Petros and the word Petra. They both sound similar, don't they? Uh, they have a similar meaning, but they're two distinct words. And according to the Greek lexicographers, these are the people that would be so boring to talk to because they're, they're so well studied and academic, but they're the people that you can trust when it comes to the study of languages. According to all these people who know way more than I do about this, this kind of thing, Petra, Petra means, it's a, uh, it means rock, and it's almost always used to describe a large, solid rock, a slab, if you will. It's a foundation upon which you might build on, which is how Jesus uses it on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7 and verse 24. The one who, you know, the, the wise builder, he builds his life upon the rock, upon the words that Jesus has spoken. Petros, Petros on the other hand, which is Peter's name, it's a masculine word, and it's used to describe not a large slab of rock, but like an isolated stone, a, a smaller piece uh, of the rock. And all the scholars agree that these two terms, I know this is nerdy, just hang in there, these two terms are not interchangeable. They're distinct terms. And so Jesus is, is he's not min mincing his words, he's not mixing anything up here, he's making a distinction between Peter and the foundation. And it just makes sense. If Peter meant to say, or G if Jesus meant to say, Peter, you know, you're the foundation of my church. Then why didn't he say, you are Petros, Peter. And on this Petros, I will build my church. He didn't say that. Or you are Petros, and upon you, I will build my church. He didn't say that, does he? He says, you are Petros, and upon this Petra, 
I will build my church. So he's pointing away from Peter. He's pointing to a, a, a previous antecedent, something that's already been said. Can you think of anything that's already been said? What Peter just said in verse 16, the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And doesn't that just make sense that Christ would build His church on deity who is faithful rather than humanity who fails time and time again? It just makes sense. If you want something to stand, you let God do it. If you want something messed up, you let the government, no, you, you let us do it, right? It, it, it makes sense semantically. It also makes sense scripturally as well. Whatever is being taught here in Matthew 16, you've got to hold it up to different scriptures in the Bible and make sure that it jives with all the different, uh, all the different scriptures. First of all, if you trace the, the, the word rock in the Hebrew scriptures, when it's being used figuratively, which is how Jesus is using it here, it's never used symbolically to describe a human being. It's always used to describe either a messianic prophecy of Jesus or of God himself, especially in the Psalms. If you open up to the Psalm of David in Psalm 18 and verse 2, I'll read that for you in just a moment. Psalm 18 and verse 2, David says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. He is immovable. He's steadfast. He's something that I can count on. He's always going to be there. And that's just a sample of what you see in the Old Testament. It always refers to God. Second of all, if you go to 1 Peter chapter 2, when later on, when Peter himself writes some of the New Testament, Peter, the Petros, he wrote about the when he wrote about the church, he never identifies himself as the church's foundation. First Peter chapter two, he gives a string of Old Testament verses here, and coming to him in verse four, First Peter two verse four, coming to him as as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, that's Jesus, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a corner stone, and he who believes in him, this stone is a person, and it's Jesus. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they're disobedient to the word and to this doom. They are also appointed. And so he, he applies all these Old Testament prophecies about rocks and stones and he applies them to Jesus and not himself. So the church is built upon Jesus and not himself. And Christians, we are like stones too, but we're like living stones being, like individual bricks being built up into this great temple of God. And then, you, of course, you've got the clear statement. Do you remember the song that we just sang? The church's one foundation. If you, if you ever have questions about a verse uh, on a topic and it just doesn't seem clear, look to another verse on the same topic that is clear, and that will help you understand what that verse is teaching. Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, <clears throat> he says in verse 11, and there's, there's no way to, to misconstrue what he's saying here. He's very clear. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is the foundation of the church. And the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2.20, if you go back and read that, they are depicted as foundation stones. I think what's being talked about there is that they're preaching Christ Jesus. And they're laying that foundation. And Jesus Christ himself, though, is the cornerstone and he is the foundation upon which the church is built. And so I think the scriptural testimony is clear. The church's one foundation is Jesus. Let's get back to Matthew chapter 16 then. Matthew chapter 16. 
So hopefully we've cleared up the confusion about what, the, what rock is the foundation of the church. But also this great construction project that Jesus promises to begin his work on is eternally invincible. It will continue. It will stand, as we say. It will never be shaken. It will always remain. He says in verse 18, And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Overpower what? Overpower this work, this construction project, this building, this church. No power, no power on earth or in heaven will conquer Jesus' church or, or stop Jesus from building it. Even the gates of Hades, the gates of death itself, this idiom for death, will not stop Jesus from completing his mission. Remember when Hezekiah got sick, he said in, in Isaiah chapter 38, he was going to die. And he said, in the middle of my life, I am to enter the gates of Sheol or the gates of Hades. I'm going to go down to the grave. I'm going to die. Jesus says, death itself is not going to stop me from completing my construction project. And who is in charge? Who, who has the keys to death in Hades? Who is the one standing at the gate of Sheol, the gate of, of Hades? Satan is the one. He's the one who's described as in charge of all this. And so death usually uh, spells the end of a construction project. For us, you know, <laughs> if, if you're going to start a building and you get halfway done and you die and you have a heart attack, guess what? It ain't getting done. But not so with Jesus' construction project. Not even death itself can stop Jesus. Death could not keep its prey. Hebrews 2 and verse 14, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, He Himself, this Jesus likewise, also partook of the same. He became a man, flesh and blood, like you and I. That through death, He might render powerless Him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Jesus, in other words, is pictured as taking the keys of death and Hades back from the devil. Do you like that? How's that for an image? This belongs to me. You get back in your place in the abyss. These are my keys. I'm in control of death now. That's exactly what he says in Romans 1, or Revelation 1 and verse 17 and 18. When John saw Jesus, he fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me. Jesus, the risen Jesus, appears in glory to John. And he says to him, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last and the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. What an encouragement that would be to Christians who are being martyred in the first century. Jesus is the one standing at the gate. He's the one who has the keys. He holds the power over death. And that's exactly how Peter preaches. The first sermon, Acts chapter 2 and verse 24, after Jesus is risen from the dead, God raised Him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for Him to be held in its power. Jesus, the great, the great Messiah, come from the line of David. David prophesies, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. On the third day, Jesus was raised from the dead. And so death itself, the ultimate ender, <laughs> couldn't end, couldn't stop Jesus from building His church. But you see, the great thing about being a Christian, I know I've said it a hundred times, I'll say it again, what's true of Jesus is true of His children. His victory is our victory too. Death will not overpower those who com comprom or comprise His church. The members of His church will experience the same victory over death that Jesus did. When we're united with Him in a death like His, we will also be united with Him in a resurrection, in a life like His, when we immerse ourselves into Jesus. And we become one with Him in His death. We become one with Him in His resurrection. And we will overcome death in a literal resurrection someday, a bodily resurrection when Jesus comes back and He blows the great trumpet. Oh, death is swallowed up in victory. Where is your victory, death? Where's your power? Where's your sting? The sting of death is sin. Jesus took care of that. The power of sin is the law. He fulfilled that. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' construction project couldn't be stopped. It would continue. 
And it is today a living witness of the power of God that we can sit here in this assembly and sing songs of praise to Him as members of His church. In verse 19, Jesus says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Peter will, future tense, be given the keys of the kingdom. You know what keys symbolize? They symbolize authority. I authorize you to drive my car by giving you my keys. Here you go. You've got the power. There's not much power in my car, but you've got it. <laughs> right? But I give you the authority by giving you those keys. This is what Jesus is doing here. And later, Jesus would condemn the Pharisees and scribes for shutting the kingdom's door in people's faces, for locking people out of the kingdom by their faulty teaching and their bad example. In Matthew 23, Jesus says to them, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. You do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. And by contrast here in Matthew 16, Peter is going to be the one who is opening up the gates. He's going to be the one who's going to be showing people into the kingdom. Come on this way. This is where Mount Zion is. This is where salvation is. This is the assembly of God. The assembly of the firstborn, of myriads of angels, at the foot of Mount Zion. This is where you worship God, in the church of Christ. Open your song books, please, the song that Bill has chosen for our invitation song, 287. 287. This church that Jesus built, in verse 18, it's almost synonymous with the kingdom of God. If you're a member of His church, then you have entered the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is something to be entered. It's something to enter into. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Peter revealed God's will on admittance into the kingdom. And it's predicated on faith in Jesus, being the raised Messiah of God, repentance of your way of life, and baptism in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. This is the answer that he gave in Acts chapter 2, in verse 38, when sinners were lost. They had nowhere to turn. And Peter says, no, there's a way out. And it's the way of grace. The way of grace, that's the way into the kingdom of heaven. If you humble yourselves, if you turn away from your, your, your present course of life, and if you immerse yourself into the death of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and when you enter into God's kingdom, you are added to the church that Jesus built. You are not added to a denomination. You are not added to a local assembly of saints. You are added to the universal church. You're added to the church of Matthew 16 that Jesus built. And God provides the rescue. He, he, he takes you out of a domain of darkness and sin and He delivers you and transfers you into the kingdom of His beloved Son. It is the work of God. And He will add you to His church. Not some hyphenated brand of Christianity, but to Jesus Himself, to the body of Christ. And you will be, by divine will and divine power, living stones being built up as a holy habitation. You will be part of God's temple, God's construction project. So we end the lesson by simply extending that offer. If there's somebody here who wants to be part of what God is doing in the world, who wants to be part of God's mission. You want to be part of, of, of the giving and the spreading of the gospel of grace and be part of this great construction project. And all you must do is respond to the gospel in, in the way that Peter has pointed out in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And we simply want to uh, extend that invitation